Hello, everybody, and good afternoon, good morning to wherever you are. Let me say, if you can't hear me anymore, that may be due to my being in Amman, Jordan, in a hotel room, and I very much hope our audio connection will hold up. It may also be due to me losing my train of thought. It happens sometimes. So, without further delay, simplified measurement verification and quality assurance instruments. And we'll be looking at energy, water, and CO2 savings, methodologies, and examples. I'll start with some guiding questions that have led us to the simplified MNV work. First question is, what approaches are available to compromise between no MNV at all, which in my experience and maybe in yours as well is a very common case, in particular when it comes to in-house implemented projects. And on the other side, the accuracy of a full-scale MNV effort. So what's maybe available in between those two extremes? Second question, how can the efforts for MNV be reduced, but still a sufficient level of verification maintained? Can performance-based energy services be made accessible for a smaller question, what's an understandable and sufficient level of MNB for facility owners, for clients' needs? So maybe you can bear these questions in mind. I think Hans also distributed them in advance of the call, and I would be very interested to hear your thoughts on those. What I'll be reporting is based on a Task 16 publication that we published in the European Council for an Energy Efficient Economy Summer Study 2014. And there were a number of Task 16 experts involved. I think we also made this paper available through the Leonardo website. Outline of the talk. I'll start with some motivation from megawatt hours referring to angle levels to saving cash flow. Can that be simplified? I'll give an overview of savings methodologies, and I'll outline our proposed solution, which is a combination of simplified approaches with so-called quality assurance instruments. And for those of you who are have a background in IPMDP, uh, also IPMDP refers to quality assurance instruments as operational verification. It doesn't play a very uh, leading role there, but it, the concept is very similar to the operational verifications. Then I'll move on to give you some examples of MNV and QAI for electricity saving measures, for thermal saving measures. And I'll give you an example of a norm that will help us to, in support of computational verifications. Then we'll take a look at possible examples of quality assurance instruments, come to some summary conclusions and discussions, and also give you a short outlook what we're planning to do within Task 16 for the next two to three years. This next slide is probably familiar to many of you, but just to set the scene and have a common terminology, I wanted to refer to an initial baseline period that we need in order to compare a consumption during a reporting period. And savings follow the very basic equation that it's a baseline minus an actual consumption. And from that basic equation, you can tell you can never measure a saving directly as in a megawatt meter, megawatt hour meter. It's always an indirect appraisal. It's always a calculation between a baseline period and a reporting period. So what's our motivation to do measurement and verification? Basically, it's 
translating megawatt hours to savings cash flows. And we're needing to assess the quantitative outcomes of a savings measure. And we're trying to translate the physical savings for the energy units into currency units, cash flows, for example, to refinance an investment into an energy conservation measure. So that's pretty clear. But in reality, there's a number of obstacles uh, in the m and world. And the quest first question is, it's always a calculation. And that sense is always an estimate based on a calculation. How accurate are we really? Measure measurement and verification is at least perceived as complicated. There is a lack of data, for example, baseline data or reporting period data. There's a lack of resources and comparability between the baseline and the reporting periods. And you will probably agree that a full-scale MMV plan is not suitable, particularly for smaller projects. And then again, that's a particularity for the European markets, for example, in Germany and Austria, that we're not used to doing individual saving measures what is referred to options A and B in IPMPP. That's simply not common practice in many European markets. And I think the fifth point is maybe the most important one. For many projects, in particular when they're done in-house, there is no m and done at all. They're implemented and nobody ever follows up what the results are. So this is sort of the basis where we're starting from. And I'll give you an overview of the different MMB options available. And I'll help you guide or I'll guide you through the fine print here. If you follow me in the first column, there is basically two different options. You can look at the whole facility. That's basically looking at the utility meter or subsection. Sub section that is metered, or you can look at individual isolated measures. If we follow first the whole facility, that's pretty straightforward. It's based on the calculation method and the formula that are based on the supplier's invoice or the utility meter readings. And what's interesting to repeat again that this is the standard measurement and verification methodology used in many European countries, for example, for energy performance contracts. And the analogy, of course, to IPMVP is that this is option C in IPMVP. Then as a second option for the whole facility, you have the computer simulations, for example, based on energy performance certificates, and that would correspond to an IPMVP option D. Now, when we're moving to the individual isolated measures, you have a number of options listed here. You can have a submeter, for example, a submeter that's installed in a boiler room to measure the air conditioning system. That would comply with an option B in IPMVP. And the next option is a measurement of all key parameters. So you could, for example, measure the power savings and the operating hours of the ventilator, corresponding again to option B. And as a third methodology, you can measure one key parameter and have computational factors in addition. And our example would be a power savings for a new lighting multiplied with a number of operating hours. That would correspond to an option A in IPNB. And then our fifth group is what I call accepted computational verifications. That could be, for example, a pump simulation program. And this is an option where you don't have a direct measurement, and thus it would not comply with the basic requirement of IPNBP because it's not doing a measurement. 
And the last option is, of course, a feed-in submeter for electricity or heat. Uh, can be used, for example, for a solar system, for a CHP system, but also for a heat recovery system. So that's the overview. And again, to highlight that standard methodology is whole facility in many European countries. And when we're looking at the simplified options, we'll be looking at individual isolated measure, measures, and uh, mainly the ones that I have put a red circle around, so it's the three bottom ones. What's the proposed approach? Basically, it's a compromise between no MMB at all and a full-scale MMB approach, for example, according to IPMBP. So to give you an example, we're using a simplified MMV approach for an individual measure, for example, by measuring the key performance parameters, option A, power demand before and after implementation of the measure, or a savings calculations according to this norm, which I will come back to a little bit later. And then we're adding what we call a quality assurance instrument to verify the functionality and quality of a measure. That's, again, similar to the operational verification approach in IPMVP. So that could be a lux measurement. That could be a thermographic analysis. That could be a proof of function or whatever. You'll hear a few more examples later on. But what's important is to combine the two, to have a simplified um, measurement verification approach in combination with the quality assurance instruments to verify functionality and quality. And what's important to say that this is proposed as an additional approach for MMB, in particular for in-house projects, for smaller ESCO projects, and so on. It's not challenging the existing options for MMB uh, where they are suitable. So an additional option. Let me give you two examples. One is when it comes to thermal refurbishment of a building envelope. So you can calculate the savings, the heat savings with either a static or a dynamic heat demand calculation before and after retrofit. And you can then factor that into a flat rate cash flow by saying, I was using x megawatt hours before. I'm using y megawatt hours after. And I'm taking the difference and multiplying that with an energy price that's either indexed or not. And in order to verify the quality, we will be using a blower door test and thermographic analysis of the building retrofit after you did the retrofit in order to verify that the measure was implemented correctly. Second example is for street or indoor relighting projects, measuring power demand before and after in a once-off test on a sample of, 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 uh, of lights, for example, and then taking the average reduction in power demand and multiplying that by a either measured or deep number of operating hours and then deriving a flat rate remuneration for the savings cash flow. And as the quality assurance instrument, you could use, for example, a proof of function of the new system, compliance with the illuminance specification and measure that. So those are two examples of simplified approaches in combination with quality assurance instruments. A couple more examples are listed here in this table. Again, let me guide you through this table. Uh, the first one was a, a lighting retrofit, which is similar to the one I just talked you through earlier 
So I'll go to the second one, which is a fan equipped with a variable speed drive. And in the next column, you can see the approach that the energy savings here would be calculated by a representative measurement before the replacement multiplied by a number of full load hours based, for example, on operating records. And then you would subtract the new submeter for the fan, and the difference would be your savings. And as QAI, we would use a visual inspection and operational verification of the equipment. Another example for pumped op optimization in the boiler room would be a meter difference in electricity use. So we're measuring energy in the base case and subtracting the energy in the reporting period, both measured with the submeter. Again, for those of you who are familiar with IPMBP, that's very much in accordance with option B or A. So nothing new, but for many European markets, that is rather uncommon. Moving on to thermal examples, which is maybe not so common in the IPMDP. And uh, I have listed three here for thermal savings. One is an on-site heat or cold generation from a CHP system, from a heat pump, from a solar thermal system, or maybe from a heat recovery system. And instead of setting up a baseline, you could directly measure the amount of heat fed into the system. So you have the formula here for the savings, the metered heat energy multiplied by a factor of 95%, and that would be a factor to correct for downstream losses. In this case, a QAI, a quality assurance instrument, necessary unless or despite calibrating the meter, of course. The building envelope example I've already showed to you or shared with you earlier. And another one I'd like to share with you is the installation of thermostatic valves. That's a very common uh, energy conservation measure in, in Europe. For those of you who are not familiar with it, it's putting on a valve on a, a um, radiator in a room which has temperature, and it will open and close the valve according to the set temperature in comparison to the room temperature. And that's a, a measure that is very frequently being installed in, in retrofits, building retrofits. And the very simple approach would be to calculate the savings here by taking the energy baseline that's used for heating, multiplying that, in this case, with 80% of the thermal energy demand. Why 80%? Because that's the share of heat energy that's used for heating. The other 20% in the example go into hot water supply, which is not affected by the thermostatic valves. And then we're multiplying that by 5% because we're assuming that for each Kelvin of room temperature, we're saving about 5% of the heat energy. So it's a very simplified calculation of the energy savings through the installation of the thermostatic valves. As quality assurance instruments, we are proposing to use an of the thermostatic valves and maybe an automatic surveillance of one or two sample rooms and to connect that surveillance with an alarm when the room temperature, the set room temperature is exceeded or also if it's not reached. So those are examples of thermal heat saving measures and verifications. And now this gets into even more some fine print. Please don't attempt to read it in German. 
um, but it gives you an example of norms that have been published, in this case in Germany, and that help us to get default values for operating and lighting hours in non-residential buildings. And I'll just outline one example for you. In this case, this building that's used between, or that has two, between two and six workspaces. And the norm will give you an indication of when is typically the beginning and the end of the utilization of the room. So that will result then in our example in 11 operating hours per day. And it will give you a number of operating hours per year. In our example, it's 250. And then it will give you the number of operating hours per year. And it will also give you the average operating hours of the air conditioning system. And it will also give you an indication of the average hours of lighting. And that's given for different types of non-residential buildings. And for particularly for smaller projects, that may be a very good basis or a good enough basis maybe to agree on a number of operating hours without having to actually follow up if the operating hours were a little bit more or a little bit less. We heard about a very similar approach from our Task 16 colleagues in Korea who were following the same approach for different industries to determine what are default values for typical lighting hours per year in different industries. So they were deriving tables for typical lighting hours in office buildings, but also in industrial productions that then would serve as default values for the measurement and verification. The next point is on quality assurance instruments. And this is more or less a list of examples that we have used in our projects. And I'll just go through them with you. First of all, we use functional specifications to communicate and document energy-related objectives and minimum requirements. So for example, we're saying there is a minimum conversion efficiency of a heat pump, coefficient of performance of 3.8, for example. And that has to be verified on a monthly basis. You could do the very same for a boiler efficiency of, say, at least 94% measured and verified on a monthly basis with an energy balance of the output versus the input energy. You could, in another example, say we want to verify the source of the renewable energy used. That's in, important in projects in Austria currently where they say we want to make sure we're using regional energy sources as, as opposed to importing cheap wood chips from somewhere else. Second quality assurance that we're using is a review of the detailed planning. It's also called a second opinion report. And that review would be that the ESCO, for example, or the planner has to submit his detailed planning, and it will be reviewed by an independent source. And thus, you are making sure that the quality of the planning matches your expectations. You can do the very same do the, during the construction phase to have a third-party construction supervision. And of course, going along the life cycle, commissioning can be surveyed by an independent party. And during the commissioning phase, of course, you need to verify those functional specifications that I mentioned earlier as examples. And that can, for example, also involve the thermographic analysis, a blower door test for function, and so on. Then you have very standard approaches like energy bookkeeping or energy management systems, where you can compare 
target and goal values over the project cycle, depending on what you agree, maybe on a monthly or on yearly or a half yearly basis. Another option is building certification, like the EPBD or green building or other certification schemes. And as you can see, other ideas mean that this is, of course, not a comprehensive list, but certainly open for other suggestions. As a matter of fact, when we do calls for proposals for ESCOs, we're asking them, how will you actually verify the quality of the measures installed? And we're getting very good answers and we'll be discussing those in the procurement procedure in order to make sure that the expectations of the building owner are met. Another set of examples is typically performed by energy service providers, and some of them are the same as you heard before, proof of function for functional verifications, of verifications or periodic verifications. Um, we typically have an annual reporting and auditing uh, or maintenance records, visual inspections, and so on. And again, that's open to be amended, of course. So another example, which I don't have time to elaborate on, but just to give you a flavor that this approach is being used also for a program in Switzerland for CO2 compensation projects, as our TAS 16 expert, Markus Barreit from Switzerland, has reported. So very similar approach, comparison of verifications plus quality assurance instruments. Which leads me to my summary and conclusions. First of all, MNV is a prerequisite for all performance-based projects in order to assess savings cash flows, for example, for energy efficiency financing, of course. The simplified approach provides additional MNV options, in particular for in-house projects and for smaller EPC projects. We have so far implemented about 10 so-called integrated energy contracting projects, which is a combination of supply from renew renewable energy with savings measures in the building. And all of these projects have been implemented based on simplified M&V approaches in this combination of supply and savings. And so far, I can report that there has never been an argument between the end side or the ESCO side on those simplified approaches. The Q&A or Q&I concept is, of course, applicable to other MNV methodologies. And as already mentioned, the IPMVP mentions the computational verifications. Many industrial examples that we have found in our TAS-16 work uh, were based on, on simplified approaches where the facility owner, for example, in a big car manufacturer, was very happy to have a one-time verification, but he didn't want an ongoing measurement and verification program for a longer period for a lack of resources to follow up and so on. And a last point is that the German energy agent, DENA, has also decided to promote the concept and has actually adopted the simplified uh, measurement verification approach and is now recommending it as an additional option to the just uh, typically used utility meter option or option C in IPMVP. And I'll come back to that example a little bit later. So, but again, to make this very clear, simplified approaches are not a silver bullet. They are I would say a compromise between no MNV at all and a full-scale MNV plan. So, a couple points for our discussion. How much MNV does the facility owner actually want? 
how much is he able to understand and follow up and how much is he willing to pay money for M and V money and time. The operational verification, that combination, is that good enough? For example, if you take a EPBD building certificate, tell it or make the calculations which come out for a class A, which is the green bar, and then combined with a thermographic analysis, is that enough as M and B? Question mark to you. Are simplified approaches sufficient for finance institutes? We have some indications that the answer is yes, but I'm sure others will, will have another opinion. Happy to hear your thoughts. And another question that keeps puzzling me is that there is a large discrepancy between the requirements on MMV when it comes to an ESCO project versus an in-house implemented project. When it comes to an ESCO project, there's very high expectations on the MMV and on the accuracy of the MMV whereas if it's implemented in-house, there is no MNV at all in many cases. Why is that discrepancy so high? And some future work would be needed, and I'd happy also to contribute to that, maybe even guide that work to answer the question, how much are we actually using in terms of accuracy? How much are we trading off with a simplified approach versus a false AB approach? And that's probably dependent on the example, the case, but I'd be very happy to spend some time uh, together with other parties to look into this question. And then my last point on the discussion, I think, is a very, very important one. And that's the question, is energy efficiency by itself a standalone business case or not. No matter how much m and you put in, simplified or accurate or a full-scale approach. And the answer probably is that energy efficiency by itself may in some niche markets and some cases be a standalone driver, but in many cases it is not. And on the other hand, the co-benefits or the multiple benefits, if you refer to the IEA discussion the multiple benefits of energy efficiency are just maybe even more important than the pure energy cost savings. And if that's the case, that also questions the requirements on accuracy on m and So a whole set of, uh, of questions I've raised there. Before I close, let me just give you a brief outlook what we have planned in Task 16. We want to build on our existing publications. There's another paper, what we call a discussion paper, that also reflects some national perspectives on m and uh, We'll be deepening those papers and take, for example, the experience students from Canada on board and from others as well. We're planning to prepare an academic journal publication to get the topic into the academic world. Uh, we're planning to adapt and publish national versions like the one for the German of the German Energy Agency, which I will show you the title page in the next slide. And then also continue the dialogue with the IPMVP committee and other stakeholders to see where we can share efforts and join forces to bring this topic forward. This is the title page of the German Energy Agency publication that's available on their website. And it explicitly builds on the ECEEE work um, and the ECEEE paper and the past 16 work that we did. Maybe other national versions are a next step as well. So I think that's all from my side as an input. Thank you very much for your attention, questions and remarks welcome, and looking forward, how can we join forces?